Good morning on the buy nothing day in the world. White Friday. Now, I'll invite you not to buy anything. You could donate to your favorite cause. The money that you were going to buy, a bunch of things that would add complexity to your life and would tie you down, right? You could donate to Strings Attached Cares. You could donate to your favorite charity, whatever you like. StringsAttachedCares.org. I'm talking about Wexford Carol today, as you just tuned in. Here is this beautiful, haunting, traditional Christmas carol from Ireland. So I just played it a cappella because I wanted you to hear how much beauty and how much information is packed into that gorgeous melody which was passed down through the oral tradition. Let me read you a little bit about it. Uh, it goes back very, 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 very far, a long time ago. The Wexford Carol is a traditional Irish Christmas carol originating from County Wexford. The subject of the song is the Nativity of Jesus Christ. So Wexford Carol sometimes known by its first verse, good people all this Christmas time. Uh, it was renewed, had renewed popularity due to the work of William Flood, who was an organist and musical director. He transcribed the carol from a local singer and had published in the Oxford Book of Carols. Now, one of the things that I'm really passionate about is when I find a melody that whether you know about theory or not, it, that brings me back to the beauty and the mis mystery of music. And when you just hear that melody, it steer, stirs up something inside you, whether you can put your finger on what that is, but it's a certain gorgeous, mysterious, sort of just looking, it's like looking at a beautiful meadow filled with flowers. Maybe it doesn't mean anything specifically, but you just look at it and you have this sense of awe just from the melody. Now, like a scientist does, your sense of curiosity is, well, why is that? So why is that melody so beautiful? And I've been watching the Quincy Jones documentary. Quincy Jones, who's in his 80s, was an amazing arranger. One of his first great gigs was working for, does anybody know? Frank Sinatra. And... My dream has always been to make it as an arranger first. That was one of the things. But in this age, people don't know a lot about what does an arranger do? Well, so Quincy, when he worked with uh, Frank Sinatra, was considered a great musician just from his arranging skills and being able to lead the orchestra. And Frank, Frank Sinatra would bring him on stage and say, this wonderful gentleman has made these beautiful arrangements that I'm singing over. So he was just as much a part of becoming famous in the band and being recognized as a part of the music. That was popular music in the early 60s. So anyway, I just want to mention that, that that's a really great documentary to check out because that's where I'm coming from, from my ears. I'm Arrangers, we start with the melody and we go, what can we do with that? What sonic information is coming from the melody? Now, the... Wikipedia here mentions this is a lovely tune remarkable for its haunting Mixolydian mode form. For those of you that aren't musicians, you know, you don't know what Mixolydian is, but if I play, you might go, wow, I love the sound of that. And that's how I respond to it as well. I love the sound. Yeah. So, you know, just like an architect can go in there and look at how that building is made, on a, on a real specific level, we as arrangers and composers do the same thing. And there's little clues in there that are so fascinating that you, as a listener, even though you don't know what's going on in here, I'm sure you can tell that something special is going on. If you just take the melody by itself, 
Now that right there, that's actually in the major key. If I go, that's, but that later on he comes back, or whoever made the melody, and, and plays this melody. So the Mixolydian has this sense of two chords a whole step apart. It sounds like this, which is very popular in rock and roll. Right? Everybody's familiar with that sound. Or let's say uh, Norwegian wood. If I play Norwegian wood. Uh, right? So you get this sound. So, first of all, that is the kind of the sound, the gorgeous sound we're hearing. And then, but something really special happens for a moment that in the middle of this song, something really special. And whether, whoever made this up, they could have done this by ear. Maybe they weren't a composer. But here's something, a clue. I like looking at these clues. And in, in, in Wikipedia, it talks about that this is a great tune for beginning, uh, beginning uh, chordal players because they can make the whole thing work just from two chords two chords you can actually so what would the melody sound like I asked myself if I played it over just two chords and you can see that it works so somebody that doesn't have that much facility can play the whole melody it sounds like this and let's say if I don't if I leave out the third okay I just want to give you a clue if I just play two root two fifths apart so that's G that's F what would it sound like it sounds like this Here's the, that's the chord, the second chord. Now, I'm not saying there's any truth to this, I'm just saying let's, let's, warm, let's have an experiment and see what that would sound like. And maybe, maybe we'd find something out, just like science. Those are the two chords. Now here's the middle section where something really gorgeous happens. I'm leaving the third out in the left hand. So let's go to the F there. Oh, I'm only using the two chords. So here's the interesting, interesting thing from an analytical standpoint and the beauty of that if you're a beginning player and you just play literally two fifths on the guitar or on the you still get this gorgeous, creative, sensual melody without much harmonic information happening. So just in the melody itself, and if, if you are a musician, you heard that the melody briefly goes into the, what we call the parallel minor. So the parallel minor would be, it kind of went off into this mysterious minor section. So. I thought that was really interesting. But it's not totally in a mixolydian mode because the first phrase is in a major key. So uh, it's just a beautiful melody and it's on our new CD. It's the second cut on stringsattached.man, stringsattached.bandcamp.com. All of our three, Karen and I, have three Christmas releases. They're there. You can go check those out. It's the second cut and you can listen to it right now. And one of the things that I like to do as an arranger is take my ears and my brain and see, uh, pl just have experiments, pr have, perform experiments with the melody to see what I can bring out, what beauty I can bring out. And then use those, uh, the science of it to kind of go, what if? To kind of ask the question, well, what if I do this? What will it sound like? So I know one of the problems with having two chords a whole step apart is that you have what we call parallel fifths. So, what could I do to avoid the parallel fifths, and what would that sound like? What, what could I do to make it just more interesting, more creative, more juicy to the ears in the same way that this melody is? What could I do? So, I come up with things like this. If I'm going down, I could basically keep, let's say if I play the first chord G here. This note going down, that is the parallel fifths. What if I go, what if I keep it there? and I have one note go up, and I get something like this. So that there, those are two chords 
that are a whole step apart, but there is I'm avoiding the parallel fifth by making one note go up and the bass is going down. That's called contrary motion. And you get this kind of beautiful sound. And you come back home when you come back to the one. Here's the flat seven. Here's the one. Can you hear it? Another thing I could do is I could play what we call an inversion. So I could play. How's that sound? It has this beautiful sort of vibrational quality to it. That's the second chord, the F in first inversion, with I'm holding the the one over that. So it's it's very beautiful. So I did that in my arrangement. I'll show you what I did. I go. Here's a parallel fifth. Now I go back to the one in first inversion. And then I go back to one here. And then here's the, the F over A. See? It's this sort of, I don't know, it just feels good. <laughs> but that I came upon that by experimenting, saying, okay, let's how can we avoid the parallel fifths? What are some possibilities if I avoid the parallel fifths with my voicings? And one of the things that I think it is, is it's this beautiful, you've got, um, you've got this kind of open quality. This chord seems really open to me and it's vibrating to the ears. It just sounds really good. And that's where, essentially as composers, that's what we're working with. We're working with going away from home and coming back to home. This is away from home, but it's a very consonant away from home. So when I resolve back to, if you listen to this note right here, duh. You'll hear it go down a head step nah, when I go back to home. Can you hear that? Check it out. Okay. I could also do this. I could go. Ah. Okay. Uh, another thing uh, that's cool. So what I did when I created my arrangements, I sort of created this vamp between the verses based on this chord progression that slightly avoids the parallel fifths. And it sounds like this. If you listen to the arrangement right now, Wexford Carroll, second cut on her album, stringsattached.bandcamp.com, you'll see the new album. There's three there. Go listen to that and hear the intro with the guitar. So I'm doing something like this. So, you know, maybe... a musician who doesn't know about the parallel fifths, they might just play. Something like that. Which sounds real church-oriented, right? So I put my own sort of jazz improv, not jazz improv, but more like specifically worked out progression to it. Just for the intro. You guys can go listen to that right after. So here's what I did. As an intro to kind of create the mood of that Mixolydian mode. So I'll start with this. I actually put a, the second degree in there, the A, which also sort of foreshadows the there. Okay, that's the second chord, then and then I go up to the first inversion. And then I do it again. Now, another cool thing is I'm looking at analyzing that. Another thing that's great about the Mixolydian mode, for those of you that are still with me <laughs> watching this, is normally when you, if you're in a major key, let's say this, you have what we call the leading seventh, the sharp seven, right? Which gives us this feeling. Now, if you're in a Mixolydian, you don't have that F sharp anymore, you have this. Now, so if I were to play what they call the dominant chord in a mixolinear mode, it sounds like this. It has a simple. So you, what we have is called a minor dominant chord, which is gorgeous. So I could I could play the melody with instead of the F, I could also use the D minor chord. So it could sound like this. Uh, That's another interpretation. Instead of playing the F, I could play the, which I kind of like. 
It's very timeless. It has that beautiful quality. And then back. And then I could go. What if I played the four chord here? Or I'm just experimenting with different things. Because we're on that D minor. We played B flat. Which I don't really like that B flat there because. We don't want to have the B flat yet because that comes later in the melody in the middle. That B flat really changes the whole tonality to G minor. Yes. We don't want to. So th I'm looking at another arrangement and they put the B flat chord in there at the top, which I don't like because it's giving us that minor feel already. So I want to keep it in that. The melody itself is saying to me, look, I'm in mixolinian, I'm in major for the A, A section. For the B, it's definitely going to to the minor. So I don't, personally, if I were arranging this like a Quincy Jones, these are the things that we think about. I don't want to do what this guy did, B flat. I want to keep it in that major or keep it in that mixolydian. So, so what I did was more of a thing like this. And then A minor here. And then there's another uh, one chord in first inversion. And then back to the... Now I could go, there's that F chord, and then I go, I think I went to, and then same, I could do, and then here I went to a, a four chord over the one, so that's, that's a C, I went, because that melody is implying that. And then I did a variation. Instead of playing G here, because normally you would go. You would go back to home. I play the relative minor here. I go. Isn't that gorgeous? And then I bring back the F here. To kind of give us back to that mixolydian. Now everybody's going, God, this is so technical. Well, yeah, it is. But ultimately, it's your ear. It's ultimately your ear that decides, do I like that? Does that work as an arranger? And ultimately, I like that. So <laughs> ultimately, I like, I go like this. And also, your brain can lead you down paths that your ear may not hear, which is really interesting. So if I, if I play this part of the melody here, I'm already thinking of another way. I'll have this conversation. Right here, this, I said I was gonna go. That gorgeous sound. So that's over a G. What if I played that over a C? What would that sound like? Let's go. Let's try it. And ultimately, my ear will decide. Okay, that's good or not. Okay, we're gonna try. Kind of cool. And what if I played? That's kind of cool. And I go. Nope, don't like that. That's the E minor substituting for the G. So. It's ultimately a process. Beethoven did the same thing. How many different permutations can you come up with? Variations. And then ultimately, it's your taste. Your personal taste which decides which ones to do. The brain, the theory, is only a doorway to more possibilities. And I encourage everybody to check that out. Listen to the cut, stringsattached.bandcamp.com. Yes, I'm on coffee this morning. This is Wexford Carroll, if you just tuned in. And I'm making a little video for each song on the album because these melodies are so gorgeous. The me Think about it, folks. When, when you're thinking of a song, what do you remember first? Usually the melody, right? Usually. You're like, I don't really know the lyrics. I have to look up the lyrics on the internet. I mean, all the singers I know, oh, I can do that song as long as I have the lyrics. It's the melody. Why is that? Something related to evolution, right? Why is it that the melody survives so easily and it sticks in our heads? The people know that. The marketing folks know that. So anyway, I'm making one video for every, hopefully, one, one. That's right, Matt, you know it. One, so if you're a songwriter, write an amazing, sticky, gorgeous melody. Start with that. That's what Billy Joel did, right? Or that's what he said he did. Let me play you a little Billy Joel that actually sounds kind of like this song. Melodically speaking, it's very Irish. Who knows this tune? I bet you know this tune, but you probably, if you haven't heard it in a while, you may not know the lyrics. 
If I just play the melody by itself. Who knows that? What is it? This is the great part. I forgot the rest of it. <laughs> but anyway, you get the idea. Here, this is the melody by itself. You know, there's just something in the melody, something timeless that doesn't mean anything in doesn't mean anything in particular. It's just beauty of starting at home and going away from home. Now I'm away from home. Now I'm coming back to home in some way. Sort of home, but a little bit up in the air still. And then... forever about away from home back home and then Billy Joel throws in a curveball here harmonically which is not really in the melody let's see if I can remember it yeah back to the A section, back home. So it's very similar. This melody is an A, A, B, A, just like Wexford Carol. Wexford Carol is A, A, B, A. And the B is like a version of A, kind of, on both of these, but with a little curveball, harmonically or melodically thrown in. So with Wexford Carol, it's... If you just tuned in, and if you've been here for a while, you're wondering why I'm going on and on, it's because people keep coming in. So <laughs> it's just so much fun. Okay, so... Here's the A. Yeah, Matt Matt says, my dyslexic brain struggles hard with theory. Is why I tune in. That's good. But, I think there's some basic stuff to theory that, if you just start with the scale, you probably hear that and go, well, what notes could I change? Just, you know, G, A, B, look on the piano, Matt. And what if I just change one note? What would I, what, what would it sound like? What if I went, if I did that? I'd literally change only one note there. It'd open up a whole new world of melodicism. And then I could just use my ear. What kind of melody could I create with that? I could be like, what, where do I want to go? What? How do I want to tune into that? I could be, a, you know, just just experimenting here. And that was all created because I performed an experiment, right? And so this this tune Wexford, what the guy did was, or whoever, all the years that contributed, maybe it was a crowd sourced. You know, one day somebody just heard this note. Instead of playing, they changed it. Literally, that B section, like I'm saying, has a little curveball thrown in. Right? So what, the way Beethoven worked was the same deal. He would sit down and try different permutations. He would go, oh, wait a minute. What if I change that one note? Just that one, one note during that section. I mean, I'm being very simplistic here, but the point is, okay, that this formula of A, A, B, A, the B being something sort of even outside the box, same thing on this tune, As So It Goes by Billy Joel. So, but Billy Joel does it more in the harmony, plays that. So we start off really, and he goes, right? So that's the B section for Billy Joel, but he's still playing that same melody idea, which is, he, you know, first part of the melody goes, 
right? And then the B for Billy Joel goes. All right? He's still working off the same idea. And that's what Beethoven did too. It's like exhaust all the possibilities, right? Now, that could be in a that you know, everybody hears that as minor, but it could be What if you did that? Then it wouldn't be in a minor. <laughs> all right. So, and even then, what if you went <laughs> so, and then he goes. Right? So what is he doing? He's exhausting all the possibilities with that one riff, that one motif. Uh, whereas again, Rexford Carroll. Repeat it again. So A. So question, answer. Those two phrases. Question, answer. And then the bridge comes in with another question. Leaps way up there. And rhythmically, it's kind of doing the same thing. Da, 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 da. So all those things work together so that the listener, they're not thinking about this, but they feel this sort of play between familiarity and uncertainty. Familiarity, oh, I like that rhythm. Let me hear it again. So. Anyway. So whether you do this on a sort of just toning in level, or you combine the two together, use theory to perform experiments, which then lead you down different pathways, and you're still going to tune in even though you're using the theory. Because ultimately, I'm not going to pick something just because it looks good on paper. I'm going to pick it because it feels good to my heart, or it feels good to my ears. It looks good to my ears. <laughs> So I encourage you guys to watch the, from the beginning of this video when I take that melody for Wexford Carol, which is on our new CD, Mandolin Christmas Volume 2 featuring Karen Mall. I play guitar on it. You can listen to the whole thing right now, stringsattached.bandcamp.com. And I'm making these videos because this is the new world of selling music, of making people, giving something, giving some value for you to enjoy this music and hear it, maybe on a different level that, or add some value to your listening experience. Okay, talk to you guys later.